Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Causal Linkman Seminar after our break last week. We are very excited today to have Bin Yu from the University of California at Berkeley, who will talk to us about predictability, stability, and causality with a case study to find genetic drivers of the heart disease. Bin has a few collaborators in the QA, uh, Anna Kenny and Omar Ronan, two of them. Uh, after Bin's talk, we'll have a discussion by Jal Sagan from Yale University. Questions today will be handled by Dominic. Uh, thank you, Georgia. Yeah, as usual, please submit your questions via Q&A. We'll bring some of them forward to Bin. Uh, also, we might unmute you if we have enough time to ask your questions personally. Yeah, without further ado, let's get started. Uh, Bin, whenever you're ready, you can now reshare your slides. I just sent you the... Okay. Thank you. Now I have to look for the sharing. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Dominic Georgia, for inviting me and thanks to Ying for helping um, getting this set up. So today I will share um, actually a quite long journey um, towards causality in my group and starting from um, the stability paper was 2013 and then the uh, cardiology project just kind of being written down. So it's like nine years or 10 years. And um, feel free to jump in and ask questions. I think it's much interest, more interesting to have a interactive discussion. So the title is Predictability, Stability and Causality with a case study to find genetic driver of heart disease. And we're really in, living in this age of AI, everything's being called AI. And it's a different discussion what's really AI, but nevertheless, I like, Bill Gates quote, AI is like nuclear energy, both prominent and dangerous. And a lot of my group's work has been in the frontier of, um, I would say, uh, machine learning or AI in biomedical problems. And I like to set the paper, um, the, the talk with this background um, project that has been lasted four years at least. So it's a supported, now finished inter-campus award uh, with Chan Zuckerberg and Biohub. And the work I present here mostly, uh, mostly led by my group and also you and Ashley, the guy on the left with a tie, who is a cardiologist from Stanford. And we really started closely working with a uh, junior colleague of his, the one with white coat and James Priest. And the first phase of the project was led by two young people, Merle Burrow, who is now back in Germany, actually now already as a tenure professor in Regenberg. And then my former student, Carl Kumbir, in um, now UCSF. And the second phase is led by Tiffany Tang, a current graduate student, and then Chen Ru Wang, who is a uh, postdoc with UN. And I have two co authors, uh, Almer and, and Anna here, which really heavily engaged with the experimental analysis stage. So the problem we try to tackle is this hypertrophic cardiac myopathy. So the left ventricular chamber of a heart becomes thickened. You can see that it's much enlarged and you create a lot of problem for the heart to pump blood and you can faint, you can have heart attack. So it's pretty fatal and occurs in one in 500 patients in the US. So this is called HCM. And our approach, of course, with us being the statistician data scientist, we go in with um, the training of a data scientist and use which is part of AI, computer science, math and stat, machine learning, sit in the middle and domain on. We work very, very closely with you and Ashley's group uh, for this project. And there's a general scene behind all of this is really our attempt try to build a pipeline for sharing best practices to maximize the promise and toward trustworthiness for AI or data science. And our view of data science really as almost like, try to recall what we used to do in statistics, quality control, right? So that's on factory floors. Now actually AI is also going to factory floors, but we need to see data science as a life cycle, meaning many, many, many steps. 
So if one of your relative can be treated by whatever developer HCM, then I hope you agree that we won't just should not only care about the modeling and algorithms, it's the bottom note in this whole time uh, data life, data science life cycle, but every step along way from problem formulation, data cleaning, which is under uh, <clears throat> appreciated step and data cleaning, visualization, what color you use and how you interpret, which plot you use, how you communicate. And then you kind of go in a cycle and often you go back to earlier steps, not like this is a sequential and people and the human judgment calls are very much at the heart of what we do. And we need to make that part transparent and make it a quality control process. So the vertical data assigned term was actually suggested by Tian Zhang, who's a colleague from Columbia University. I used to call my talk three principal data science, predictability, computability, and stability. And <clears throat> the goal of a vertical data assign, where vertical means truthful, is to extract reliable reproducible information from data with an enriched technical language to communicate and evaluate empirical evidence in context. I want to emphasize empirical evidence because um, I think we can all use more empirical evidence in our work and in the context of human decisions and domain knowledge. It's really a balance between different parts of what we do. And I think empirical evidence could really get more attention to really ensure, uh, ensure trustworthiness. So back to the HCM problem. Right, we set up to do causal genetic drivers. Like the first phase, we chose an easier problem, use UK biobank data for red hair. And that's uh, something um, we finished. There's a paper called Epi3 for epistasis discovery. But this is a much, much harder problem. We still use UK biobank data. So we didn't deal with the data cleaning part because other people have cleaned the data. And we, really embed yourself uh, with the lab with you and work more like integrated lab to get into domain knowledge and met closely with um, a junior colleague, Chad, <coughs> and also Chen Ru from UN lab. And we interact with them mindful of confirmation bias. So we actually give them different recommendations. Some were coming out from a pipeline, some just random, some are not really highly ranked. So really make sure the a domain knowledge we extract from them are authentic, not just because they try to be nice to us. And then UN's lab did a knockdown experiments. So this is the approach we took, right? We're virtual data science with predictability, computability, stability, and then we went for knockdown experiment. I know it's not the common approach, it's observational data, but I'll comment on that later. So for the rest of the talk, I'll introduce the PCS framework and documentation. And the PCS framework is really a conceptual critical thinking framework. You can use it to stress test other people's work as we did with uh, many uh, critical decision rule um, with uh, PCON consortium data. Or you can use it to develop new methodologies, which is what we did to add stability to eat random forest for us to do nonlinear model selection. And then we use domain knowledge and the database. And then uh, we, reach uh, arrive at causal inference through knockdown experiments. And then I'll end with the software packages we have produced to implement more easily the uh, PCS framework and simulations. So PCS stands for predictability, computer st uh, and stability. Uh, it's really attempt started by um, myself about 10 years ago with a paper called stability to really try to follow up on Leo Bryman's uh, paper called Two Cultures 20 years ago, to really actually integrate machine learning and statistics and expand both significantly. So predictability is used for reality check, computability is always there and we should do more in terms of um, thoughtful simulations to help us develop methodologies. And also uh, stability is a significant expansion on uncertainty, robust statistics, stability in control theory and very broad minded concept and upstream to problem formulation, linguistic stability, data cleaning, different versions of clean data and even EDA. So it's really uh, um, significant expansion of the sample to sample and robust statistics. And we have a nice joint by uh, my co-author of my book, Rebecca, to tie them together. And documentation is a huge part of this uh, PCI um, framework. 
because models are mental constructs. They have nothing to do with reality unless we bring the evidence together through narratives. You cannot make assumption hold in your context with more symbols. You have to use narratives, domain knowledge, and, and basically convince other human beings why your ex has any correspondence with reality. Because there's randomness in data collection doesn't mean that you should name a random variable for your data. Because you, you cannot imagine another situation that another realization of the same random variable can be collected and there's no need for random variable. I definitely didn't think about it for 25 years. And random variable is assumption. And you're assuming there's a two physical situations at least that they're kind of similar enough to put them together through a random variable. And that's implicit a stability assumption. And you also record your judgment calls and also what are the perturbation you do and why they're reasonable using domain knowledge and data collection knowledge. PCS connects science with engineering. Predictability and stability are really two scientific principles. And computability, of course, we have compute. But what we include in C in PCS is also data-inspired simulation. Many research groups do, but we now have a simulation package called SimShap in R to help you do it more efficiently, more streamlined. As I mentioned, I started on a journey of stability 20, well, 10 years ago with the opportunity to give a two key lecture. I tried to connect sample to sample variability with model perturbation as um, embedded in robust statistics. I also advocate stability as a minimum requirement for reproducibility and later for interoperability. And you have to argue why certain perturbation are reasonable. Right? You have time series data, you scramble up the time uh, and create the data. That's not a reasonable perturbation. You, because you didn't keep a crucial structure in the data and any testing based on scrambling up the, the different data in a time series, it's just a straw man, two years to beat. It doesn't mean anything about what you do uh, with time series context. So that's all, all have to be recorded in your documentation. If you really want to be high bro, I was looking for somebody who's a lot smarter and a lot older than me uh, who spoke about stability. So. Uh, Philosopher Frank gave me this quote. For true opinion by Plato, as long as they remain a fine thing and the old do is good, but they're not willing to remain long and they escape from a man's mind, so they are not worth much until one ties them down. That's why knowledge is priced higher than correct opinion. And knowledge differs from correct opinion in being tied down. So this really says that it's common sense. If you talk about anything, knowledge, oh, um, our conclusions, they should be stable. Stability is also very key to statistical and machine learning theory. Central limb theorem, if you look at Linderberg's um, swapping trick to prove central limb theorem, you're basically showing that the Gaussian distribution comes up because stability. And concentration inequality, you see conditions on stability. Random matrix that you swap the columns and you random both ways sometimes, and that's also stability. So it's not just empirically makes sense. It's also the foundation of our theory. The laws come up because we have stability. When you change one random variable by another in the central limit setting with the same variance and mean and with a third moment, that you don't change it now. You don't change the, the distribution, the, the limit distribution that's universal. And you can end up with like ODE and the only solution is central is Gaussian distribution. So everything point to the same way that stability is a first principle, both practically and theoretically. And the way we use stability is conceptual. We're not dictating like you have to use this metric. It's really trying to encourage you to do critical thinking and use the context because without context, we can have commonly L2 or L-like, but often it shouldn't be the right metric to measure prediction error, for example. So in your example, if you want to use PCS, you have to define your documentation why this is a reasonable perturbation. You can say, well, my data could have been collected, could be cleaned this way. That's why I want have two clean versions and see whether things change. And we can inc include all of them in PCS inference in perturbation intervals. And why stability metrics measured by L2? 
why not L1? Why not square root of your data? If you do death prediction for COVID, which my group did, we had three different metrics. You can also talk about stability across different performance metrics, and you write down why they make sense. And connecting to causal inference, suitable for this group, I don't need to explain, it's really a stability condition. You're really saying that the only one version of your aspirin, and doesn't depend on your health condition, where you take it, which are they, what else food you're taking, it has the same potential outcome. But in reality, of course, there's drug interaction, there are a lot of things going on. So we're making assumptions, even you have randomized experiment you're always making assumptions. And invariance, which um, started by the economy in the 40s and has been really uh, used recently by different groups, is really a stability condition relative to different environments. And randomization creates stability, right? You're basically balancing different covariates and make them stochastically similar. And propensity score assumes conditional stability because you're assuming there's conditional randomization using your domain knowledge. And sensitive analysis is exactly stability analysis. You try to assess the different assumptions and impact on your causal conclusion. So just like anywhere else, stability is actually at the heart of causal inference. So causality, I think, is not really a yes or no. It's really a evidence spectrum for causality, right? The best mechanistic model for causality is probably Hooke's law, right? You put a load at the end of the spring, the spring will enlarge by certain lines, that's the effect, right? The load is your dose and then you have effect size. But it doesn't work 100% of the time. If you got unlucky, the spring is very old, the law might not hold as yesterday because it's gonna break. If you're really, really unlucky, it will break. You're not gonna follow the Hooke's law. So even there, it's not 100%. And then you move to average treatment effect as more statistical causal inference. We're looking at group effect, right? It doesn't happen for everybody. The drug might not work, but on average. And we're looking at precision medicine that's got subgroups. We hope that you can really pin down the effect for individual patients. So with this in mind, stability is all there. We're gonna use PCS framework work towards causality. So we can use predictability and stability with sensible perturbations and of course, with computability, we're going to generate interval hypothesis or work as a recommendation system. And then we use external validation, say a knockdown experiment to confirm causality. But I want to point out that if you only use association, I think the evidence is weaker than you use both predictability and stability. It's not proof, but there's different layers of evidence I think we need to consider. Even when you make different assumptions for observational study, it would be nice to have different assumptions compared to that which one is a stronger assumption. And then you can evaluate the evidence towards causality for action, right? I know this researcher, Nancy Cartwright, who writes about causality is really the reason for action, right? That's exactly. It. Are we going to ask our experimental uh, collaborators to do experiments? And there's a cost, right? Human and financial. So we want to be kosher as much as we can so that we have good yield. And so our approach to causal inference is use PCS predictability and stability as a recommendation system for experiments. And then we do knockdown experiments. And PCS provides critically valid important rankings of genes and gene-gene interactions. Could be your other factors if you work on other problems with tens of stability or invariance checks after assuring predict signals. So P is very important. Stability with a reality check is not very meaningful. Zero is very stable, right? We're not really doing research reporting zero. You really check reality either by domain knowledge or for uh, supervised learning, we can set aside test set, which is as close as possible for the future application of your algorithm and assure uh, prediction, it's there. So uh, in contrast to conventional causal inference for observational data, people basically make assumptions using context of domain knowledge and then draw causal conclusions. And we did a little bit um, causal inference following the PCS framework. I'll come back to basically we use introduce calibration for subgroups as a model check. And then we consider 17 different Kate methods 
and use external study uh, to, to validate what we find the subgroups. It was uh, looking at a randomized control experiment, uh, try to look at the um, kind of GI events after taking a painkiller called the Vox. So in a nutshell, stability consideration after checking reality that your model actually, you know, method captures some useful structure in the data. It's really looking at the life science, data science life cycle again, and really look into the judgment calls. The problem formulation I'll get to. Data cleaning, I had my 215A student do data clean and peak, peak on a data set and three groups clean the data different way. One group cleaned away 23% data on the clean data, got the best results. And people use different performance metrics. Here actually sensitivity and specificity. Some group just one for predictability anyways. And they did different plots, different algorithms. So all of this uh, needs to be taken into account because we don't end up with group A signs, group B signs, and group C signs. We need to have some consolidation. Admittedly, that's a mental level human judgment call, but we need to sit at the table and decide which part we trust. A prominent example of the importance of data cleaning was this paper by uh, two Harvard economists about 10 years ago who advocated for austerity policies. That was the last financial um, um, slowdown. And they show which country year data, high debt GDP ratio above 90% is bad for growth. And a few years later, three uh, economists, graduates in Herdon, um, actually tried to replicate the analysis and found problems and didn't think the conclusion would hold up after the uh, re replication. And in our own work, as I was saying, we're going to look at the cell sizes because one conjecture about HCM is that because the cell sizes become large under these different genetic conditions cause HCM and therefore that's why the left ventricle wall become larger and that's why it become harder to move. So you can see that the high resolution and low resolution is gonna make a huge difference. Data perturbation we use to random split, but it can be not the right split. The best way to do step split in your data is to think about your test states as the best surrogate you can have for the future you're going to use this algorithm for. So you have different hospitals, you probably want to do hospital split, or you want to do time um, prediction in the future, you do time split. So the test data should really be your surrogate, the best you can, the best you know to represent the future situation. And then which split you use become very clear. And we did a certain split, made judgment calls. Oh, you miss that noise. Come on. disk paper. Um, and people also do different data perturbations, right? If we ask the people here, we have about 100 people here. If I give you the same UK biobank um, data, we probably end up different, doing different data perturbations. And the climate scientists are already doing their versions of model perturbations, right? If you look at the, the predicted uh, global temperature rise average at the end of the century, you're gonna see nine curves. They kind of use the same physics similar data, but they tweak their PD equation differently, the way the granality, regional or global, and then they end up the whole um, prediction from 1.5 degree to 5.5 degrees. And this is really a special case I'll call PCS inference, which I won't get to in the uh, group uh, in this talk, is that you can really talk and then you can look at end of century, whatever the region, um, we only have one observation for the global mean temperature, even that calculation can be not unique, right? How are you gonna calculate global mean temperature? So all these uncertainties, including this researcher to researcher um, degree of freedom need to be taken into account. That's really part of the uncertainty we need to report, not just after you clean the data, that's too narrow. Many, well, I give the PCS talk, many people ask me how many perturbations you do. You can never finish if you do all possibilities. So I can think of as every step, you have some equally good choices. At least you should take two paths. You should at least have two clean versions of the data and you can run the pipeline and see whether it will make a material difference. And that's made 
why is a material difference or not? That's a human judgment call. So better you have a group of experts agree or not agree. It's not significant capacity because we know we want to importance in context, not statistical significance. And whether that difference or effect size is real, um, make a difference for patients or for you to send some people for some drugs and not others. So that's come your resource constraint would play a role. But at least we should, I think, from that, really keep two clean versions of data as a minimum. And if you have, and then just run the pipeline downstream, at least two versions. It would be better you have five, but two would be good to start. And then you record all your decision in the documentation. So back to the HCM, right? So we started with UK Biobank. We did a pretty good study with red hair, the pipeline with our iterative random forest worked pretty well. We have to develop something new. But then when we look at HCM labels in the database, we found absolutely no, sim no signal. There was like a couple of months, um, a summer, like uh, 2020 summer. And we feel that it's because too many false negatives because a lot of people were not formally diagnosed by head condition. All this is all grown up uh, adults. They're not kids. There are a lot of environmental factors, how much you exercise and things like that. So we had to go back to the drawing table. So even we have the original raw data, but um, the label didn't work. There was no signal. So Weston from UN's group went to the MRI, heart MRI from all the same patients and extracted something called left ventricular mass. It's really the volume of the, the part I um, circled um, in the first heart uh, graph that really how big that part is, that the left ventricular um, wall is. And then it become a continuous variable. And then we face this, what's good enough prediction for continuous variable? We don't have any sense about the noise ceiling. And we, if we don't have any signal to say we're doing decently, how can that really in good you know, faith to recommend for people to try to knock down this gene or that gene? So we went back and worked together to really come up with this idea that we need to really make things into a binary classification problem. Take the top LVM people and the bottom, also clear the signal, it's kind of denoising, and also create the problem that we know that if we do better than 50%, we have signal. So this is actually very weak signal. I never work on problems with like, we end up with 55% consistently. But the problem is very complex. We not expect like finding cats for 90%, right? And we um, did stability. We did top 15%, 25%, and really gave me a way to know we have signal. And this is part led by my uh, student, Tiffany, who will be on the market next year. So watch out for her. And uh, now will also be on the market. So the UK by bank data start from SNP, 15 million imputed, they only uh, actually uh, measured much smaller set and have standard agreed upon way to impute for the rest. And we end up binarizing LVM, but still we need to reduce dimensionality. And one method we used uh, some marginal uh, kind of um, selection to reduce dimensionality. And we went out with like a thousand SNPs, but then we want to get nonlinear interaction. So this is uh, earlier work. That's why we joined the group together award uh, with Ben Brown, who was a long-term collaborator, co-lead and uh, two junior people, brilliant junior people. Uh, Sumanta now says, I come now, Khan Kumbir, uh, UCS postdoc, former student. And we really add stability to random forest to discover um, Boolean type of interactions, which is a well fit for genomic problems. So we're facing a much harder problem than uh, computer vision, which is pattern recognition. You know you're looking for a cat. Here, we don't know what's the pattern, but we want to find meaningful patterns. So you, you have to really define the pattern and look for them at the same time. And the traditional methods of uh, interaction, like polynomial, don't work here. 
biology don't support it. And also a lot of the genes don't have main effects, but they have interaction important effects. So you cannot go from main and pairwise and so forth. We know in Drosophila genomics, there are false order interactions. So um, if you go use the traditional way, the main effect to order two, you, you're gonna miss a lot of signals. So you have to have a way to jump to false uh, interactions without having to find the main effects because they don't have main effect act alone. So that thinking doesn't work here. And we went to biology. Biology has this um, something called the French flag. It really says that interaction vary across space and time and the biomolecules need to have abundance before they interact. So there's a thresholding behavior. And this mathematical entity decision tree is a good fit. It captures you know, to a certain extent the uh, DAA occupancy uh, phenomenon. So, and before I got on the project, Ben was working on genome for 10 years and many other people as well find random forest work pretty well for genomic problems because the decision to really capture this thresholding. And of course the thresholds is not gonna be constant, right? It depends on different other um, by molecule abundance, the threshold also varies. So random forests allow you to capture different thresholds as well. And also before us, people already thought if two genes or two SNPs fell on the same path of a tree, you jump to, uh, to biological interaction. That's a kind of mathematical fact. They fell on the same path. And then you jump to the interact biologically. And but that's very unstable. You cannot really interpret because they just change too much. So what we did is, everybody knows about random forest, uh, to add stability. So it's very much, this is was one of the motivating projects for us to develop PCS. It's really we have two or three testing case to see whether this stability really makes sense. But after predictability, we know like it, random forest works really well. So it's not like we go for stability without predictability. Predictability capture reality is something work prediction wise. It's always the first step. So the way we add stability to random forest through two ways. One is soft dimension reduction. So you have MDI, you can use other importance measures. Instead of using uniform sampling of the features, you Upweigh the important ones, whatever the important index you could do. You can also do stability, do multiple ones, right? We use MDL, uh, MDI. And then you downweigh the non important ones. So this way you uplift, you kind of reduce the very, very unimportant ones. That one's just, so we kind of still rely on some marginal important defined by the MDI, but we also try to um, do dimensionality so we don't have to consider all the features. And then the first version of random forest used uh, this random intersection trees by Sharon Manhouse and uh, colleagues in Europe to find interaction. But this step actually can also use determinist action to find these two SNPs, how many times appeared in the past of all the trees. And then we have an after loop of bagging assessed stability um, to uh, really get a stability score. So in the original paper, we represented this uh, Drosophila enhancer prediction problem, use chip data. And you can see that we start with random forest, that's why each random forest. And the, on the RC curve, we basically don't lose much at all. On the right, you see the red ones are pairwise interactions of Drosophila gene names. And then the blue ones are three-way interactions. We even find some false order interactions. So three-way interactions are at the frontier bio, bio technique technology people can now start doing, just begin to do, to check experimental history of interactions. And the red ones have been historically studied and many people have used old techniques that have ablation to study these interactions. And after we actually submitted the paper, the referee asked a good question, why should we trust the interaction? So we said we trust it because our collaborator Sue Seneca said they look good, but we didn't really, um, really asked her too hard. So we went back to Sue and Sue basically gave us all these references and 80% of what we found, this is completely independent of the literature um, that actually already been validated. So that's a really good discovery rate, positive discovery rate. 
In, sorry to interrupt yeah. you. You have yeah. around 10 minutes left. Okay. Um, so um, the we now put in with bigger enhancer data, put a, a, a browser track on the UC Santa Cruz genome browse, browser, so for other people to use it. And we also have now a theory part to random forest, a theoretical version of it. It's going to appear in PNS uh, by Merle, uh, Hu Yu Wang, and Xiao Li. A theoretical version can show that. And there are a new model called LSS, basic linear combination Boolean function interactions. We can actually find the Boolean interaction under conditions like the features independent and, and the um, Boolean interact don't overlap. That uh, really propose a new line of theoretical research for people to look at Boolean interactions, not the precise type of continuity. And then we can find the interaction without estimating the linear combination or the linear uh, or the continuous threshold. So that was quite. Um, really um, confirm some conjecture I came up with by sitting in many biohub talks that people already discover a lot of qualitative discrete structure without doing uh, computational models. So back to HCM, I already talked about this. The pipeline, we first use uh, GWAS, typical bald LMM to reduce the dimension to a thousand. And then we use E2 random forest with the binarized uh, LVM. And we feed SNP data to extract candidate gene interactions. But you have this um, linkage disequilibrium. Many SNPs are dependent. So when we collect the interaction, we collect them at the gene level. For the red hair uh, study, we actually use GTAC data to have the gene expression um, and we work with gene expression data. But for this, I think my student, Adi, um, came up with this idea that we should collect data, collect the interaction at the gene level, even the split is down the SNP level. And then we ranked different genes uh, and gene-gene interactions based on the stability scores. And we also generalized our regional stability score to the marginal score. I think uh, uh, Omar Tiffany came up with that, if I remember correctly. So now we have, uh, maybe Xiao was also engaged. Um, so now we have these genes we find. TTN, TTN is a well-known heart muscle gene, and RGF1R is a growth gene, growth factor gene, and then CCDC141 is next to TTN, and was kind of people thought they have a similar uh, functionality to TTN, but actually what we discovered is not true. So all of this we did a lot of um, with Chess help and ourselves. We did a lot of uh, annotated database. And also we try to trick them, give them three ranking lists, what we like, mid-range and random, and uh, the collaborators, both of them, you and Chen, pass our test. We don't want them to fall for confirmation and bias too easily. And then collectively with Chess help, we did a lot of um, annotated database. Um, say that they kind of reasonable. And we end up doing experiments with the top three genes, not the last three. So the knockdown experiment was done by a uh, UN's group, uh, Postal Chen Ru and undergraduate Nate Yalton prepared this samples. This is uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. So you can grow these muscle cells. They don't look like the elongated muscle cell in your body, but it's the best we can do. They look more round, this kind of stem cell um, grow on a petri dish. And it's not knock off like CRISPR, it's knocked down. You basically silence the different genes called, use this technique called uh, srRNA transfection. And Chen Ru, who is actually a PhD mechanical uh, engineering PhD from MIT, working with UN, have designed this very cool microfluidic cell solder, right? So the, the, the cells put into this machine and you have different forces flow and they get into the top outlet and bottom to separate size because we have a conjecture that the size matter. So now we knock down the genes, we will see the cell size will change. So this is the phenotype we want to observe. And this is some video to look at um, how, and she also developed a segmentation method to capture them. We can see the blue is like you find them and you, we miss many, many of the small ones are like fragments and the tall ones are the big ones. Okay, so this is, there's no way human can sit down and find them. So you need automation. And then we try to vet their image processing pipeline and Qingru already developed 
um, pipeline to find them and to find the, the area and then assume it's a circle and get a, radi a radius, but it's okay if you stay with the area. And then Omar and Anna did a lot of hard work to really manually annotate because I want to check this stage because otherwise all the cell sizes cannot be reliable if we don't trust this stage. And actually it turns out Chen Ru's method works pretty well. So after we did like 20 random images from the top outlet and we were convinced. But then we found another problem with the top outlet. What you see is that there's this huge clumps within columns of self and they get measured multiple times because the other one just go fly, fly by and you only get your months. But now this one get multiple measurements and that can really bias our result because it seems like we have many, many big cells, but this is really a, a problem with the quality control of the experiment. And Chenry was very gracious and took our uh, input into account and redesigned things and changed the flow. So, uh, and then we also removed the outliers and uh, to deal with this problem. And with a lot of hard work, a couple of months, this uh, kind of quality control work for this experimental stage. We have other results, I'll just show you one. So this is the HCM cell line. This is a red diseased knockdown CCDC and growth factor. You can see they reduce cross board the size. You can do a simple trimming test, but that's really not really affecting what's going on. Everything is significant. We have 10,000 of cells. So QQ plot actually is the best way to see the effect. You can see that not just the big cells got reduced the size, also the small cells see. So this is really saying that CCDC and growth factor, if you can silence them together, that has a protective factor. This is a disease people have this. So possibly pointing to possible um, ways to treat. And we have other um, experiments which you all, I don't have time to um, show. I just want to end with uh, two packages coming from my group. The first one already uh, called, uh, reviewed by reviewers with the JOS Journal Open Source Software called Revertical Flow. And we make the stability analysis easy. And the SimChef is make simulation easy because in our development, the RF, we actually simulated it with Boolean linear combination Boolean models. Later, we did a theory on it. And because we, we didn't have enough real data, but we used the features from the real data. And then we come up with different interactions. We know the truth and to really help develop the algorithm. So um, there are many ways. And you can also simulate different idealized models for the same methodology, which is much easier to do, at least uh, in terms of the mathematical analysis. So we should use both and really do more data inspired simulations, subject your method to multiple misspecified models. And the design principles are transparency. We want it to be realistic and want to be intuitive, modular, and efficient. So people can add to it. And the vertical flow, oh, sorry, that's what's wrong. It's already finished, I think, by Ivy, James, Raj is supposed to uh, undergrad and Chandon uh, from my group. And we really take advantage of a lot of good things coming up, Berkey CS, the Ray and ML flow to really uh, help with distributed computing, tracking results across perturbations because stability analysis do many perturbations. So data curation perturbation can be just provided. Then you can provide your own perturbations and then the, the algorithm will just, uh, this pipeline will just do it for you. And we have visualization perform metrics and packaging treat model for reproducibility and reward development. It's agnostic to Scikit-learn, PyTorch, or um, ML, auto ML, the AW version, Gluia. And we have been in discussion with Gluia and they showed quite a serious interest in putting more PCS idea into their pipeline. So we're very excited. And the sim shelf is James, Corinne, Tiffany, Merle, and Carl. And we provide tools for evaluating methods efficiently across a variety of scenarios and perturbations. And we really encourage uh, principles of strong, reliable, trustworthy data science. So it's also on GitHub, hope you find it useful. And we also have this documentation where you can just use as a template to write up your simulation with narrative and models and also uh, results. We also develop uh, some reproducible software pipeline we hope to put on GitHub um, for 
there are some other groups already asking whether they can take a look. So really upgrade the coding um, levels of statistical community. Having CS student in my group really a big help, like people like Chen Den Singh, who is a super uh, coder. Uh, all these PCS ideas are being put into a textbook written by and me and my former student, Karen Postal, Rebecca Butter, and we really pushed in to finish the last chapter on PCA inference. And we have a contract with MIT Press, and there will be a free online copy when we submit for hard print. So hopefully later this year, which up on my website. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for the very nice talk. Uh, before we move in on, maybe one very quick question from Q&A. So in Q&A, someone asked about the role of transfer learning in, in PCS. Uh, and an anonymous attendee asked, is there a role for transfer learning in your approach? Might yes. that at least force generalization assumptions to be explicit? This may be a good way to examine stability. Yeah, I see transfer learning as a, uh, as a special case of stability. So you specify, because when you do transfer learning, there are different aspects, even the whole thing is not quite stable. So you have to specify the metric, the perturbation, and how you measure that uh, to laid out what's the perturbation, which is you have a different physical situation and what things you expect to evaluate. Oh, what stability is something you're waiting to make for something to work. So it can go both with stability as assumption for theoretical work, but also stability as an empirical measure you specify to see whether the algorithm to work in a different situation. Like for example, what we find with UK Biobank, these genes need to vet it with local data, which UN's lab is collecting, because Bay Area patients are a lot more diverse in terms of ethnicity than the UK by mostly Caucasian. So definitely, excellent question. Stability, I think, oh, transfer learning is a special consideration of stability. All right. So, yeah. Great, thanks. Yeah, so with that, we should probably, yeah, move on to the discussion parts. And now we have Jazz uh, to, uh, yeah, the discussion. And then, uh, as I understand, there will be an open discussion between Jazz and Bin. Yeah, Jazz, whenever you're ready. Great, yeah, thanks. I just thought I'd give some remarks framing um, this work in the context of the history of causal inference and conference, causal inference community. And then, you know, I was gonna ask Bin some questions and see how long that goes, depending on time. Um, you know, as we know, in causal inference, we're very closely related to applications, um, you know, program evaluation and whatnot. And there's been a lot of progress in the community, uh, but we still make whimsical assumptions. Um, and they are often made for convenience because we need a theorem. Uh, they're whimsical in the sense that you got to show you're creative. So if you have a result in the same assumptions as somebody else, you get less credit than if they're new assumptions. So we don't take each other's assumptions very seriously, right? This has been long noted in the literature. So that means then uh, stability becomes a very important thing in the sense that if you don't like my assumptions, I don't like your assumptions, then well, one way to resolve that, and we can't pin the assumptions down by science because we're not doing physics. Uh, physics obviously is interested in causality. They don't have much interaction with the causal inference community for reasons that may or may not be obvious to people, but it's interesting, right? So that's how stability comes out. And previously it was often called fragility. Like in, as I was mentioning last week, the causal inference conference, the, credibi the credibility revolution in economics was, which then extended out to other fields, was partly prompted by Ed Lemer's famous paper, Take a Con Out of a econometrics that highly influenced, uh, for example, Keith Vimbin's work, Josh Angris work and other people's work. And in it, he mentioned a, a, a number of flaws, including this whimsical fragility issue, right? That are, that our critical inferences are very fragile. Um, there's two parts of his concern. One part, the causal inference community has done a great job of, right? Uh, along with the credibility revolution, which is improving our identification assumptions. Right, so we don't want identification off of parametric models that can't be pinned down by the science. So it's not that, hey, if I have a linear model, you know, think of Heckman selection models. Uh, you know, I have two different models, all the innovations coming off of differences in functional forms between the first stage and the second stage. Uh, that would be considered, if you stood up and did something like that in the causal inference meeting, it, the conversation would not go very well for you. So we want randomization, we want, 
uh, a natural experiment, we want an instrumental variable, so on and so forth. So that part of Ed Lemur's thing, we've done a much better job of, uh, although Lemur never thought of natural experiments as one way around it. He was mostly focused on randomization. But there's a second part of the critique for which there's been almost no progress. And that's the part that Ben is highlighting. And the second part is, all right, um, we have some identification assumption, but that's now just the start. And the whole data science pipeline is everything from cleaning your data, from what your estimator is. How do you pick that estimator? Do you pick it because it has the optimal minimax rate? Well, maybe I personally don't find that compelling in high stakes applications I've been involved in. It gets to the whimsical nature of those results. Again, other people will disagree. Uh, lots of things come up about how you actually clean the data, it's been pointed out, which is not a small point. It's like a very big point. For example, I was talking to a major donor for randomized control trials. And the major donor said, you know, we like randomization. That's been very helpful, thank you. But we still find that if I know the identity of the author, I will know which direction the results will be biased, right? If it's education, some people like charter schools, other people don't. If it's masking, they also have a thought on it, right? And, they, and the person's asked me, well, why does the bias remain with randomization? And I'm like, well, let's explain the whole data science pipeline. It starts from even when you clean the data, what are all these assumptions that's built in? So the donors know this. And like Ben brought up physics and how physics does stability, right? An example that a very important physics stability analysis was done by Richard Mueller from Berkeley, who's a physicist, who's a global warming skeptic. The global warming data is very touched. It's very massaged. It's extremely massaged. So it is a kind of data set that if people have an ideological preference working on, one is incredibly dubious of, just rationally so, because there's a thousand and one decisions going into it. So Richard Mueller independently reconstructed the data. He got money from the Koch brothers, which don't like, don't believe in global warming, right? And then in 2011, he did a report and said, guess what? I was wrong, global warming is a real thing. And lots of skeptics said, oh, that's actually a really important data point. Now, what was that analysis? Was it a new theory? Was it new physics? No, 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 no. It was just, you had an independent person who was skeptical of the existing community, not part of the existing community, redo the data analysis. And that was not a small thing, that was a huge thing, right? So the thing is what happens in the calls inference community, we're still, Lemur had this thing that we don't really trust data analysis, at least data analysis done by somebody else. There's been improvement because now there's RCTs, but even the RCT results, especially for cases which are ideologically loaded, right? There is a lack of belief because if you look at the published literature, there's evidence of p-hacking, i.e. null results don't get reported, the distribution of p-values clusters too close to 0.05, right on one side of it, which no theory of the process that's not clean would justify that, because under the null p-values should be uniformly distributed. When the null is false, they'd be stacked on zero. There's no distribution of that. That ends up, it's just on one side of 0.05. And a recent example of this would be the science paper on randomized control trial for masking in Bangladesh. It was published in Science, the world's leading, one of the world's leading publishers, and then millions of dollars were spent on this. And we do RCTs to end debates. It didn't end the debate, right? You had prominent people say Ben Rex, computer scientist at Berkeley, say this is utterly uncompelling. And it's become a thing. And a lot of these agreements came into the things that Ben's talking about. So how is your data clean? What model did you decide to run? How stable are your results across models? Right? And what was the process that generated one model versus another? All this is to say that we are still, we're in the midst of a major uh, replication crisis uh, across disciplines. It's more pronounced, closer you get to public policy, things that actually matter as opposed to things that we just talked to each other about, right? Um, so there's a lot of proposals. I made a joke proposal, almost a half joke proposal, which is, well, maybe AI can save us. Uh, so you have GTP3, which, could, which you, know, you know, language model, Google has their language model, uh, is very good at generating code now. So maybe the pre-analysis plans people make before they conduct something should come in natural language, should be short. Part of what's happened in natural language, which so what's happened is pre-analysis plans have grown in length as we've now required them, and now include every possible alternative, right? Uh, as opposed to being short. So it has to be short, it has to be in English so we can all read it, and then we'll have GPT-3 just write the code. 
And that will include cleaning the data, that will include your data analysis. We're not claiming the GPT-3 will be correct. We're just claiming it'll be unbiased, right? And it's almost like a bit of a joke, but I'm kind of serious, right? That if, if you are the researcher and you want to get a publication, you want to reject the null, particularly if you're ideologically predisposed to do it. So if that means you know, changing how you clean the data, that means slightly changing your estimator, you being a human will do that, right? So a lot of, so this is like the background of this reproducibility crisis. So then the question is, well, what do we do about it? Uh, ben did this excellent presentation, a large body of work, but that's, but that's the sense we should see about it. That even in the case of randomized control trials, where you think things are simple, the funders realize, the consumers realize that there's a profound issue of trust. We're not even getting into observational studies for which we may bicker over uh, you know, the causal graph, right? So, so it's a very important issue. It's quite serious in, in, in terms of will these tools, how these tools will actually be used. And, and I guess like we could start with a question for Ben and one way of starting is I know Ben and I have talked about it. We were just talking about this last week. So I thought this might be a good way to start so other people are transparent about it. So David Blackwell, the great statistician, um, famously said, it was even in his New York Times op-ed, I'm sorry, obituary when he passed away, that he said, uh, he's not interested in doing research. He's never done research. He's never been good at research. Although he's the first African-American to be a member of the National Academy of Science. The second person was over, almost 20 years later, right? And he says, I, I, I search for understanding, not research, right? So then you may want to talk about like how you think about this incentive problem or reproducibility and people and understanding research versus working on papers and publishing papers. Because the joke was the, the things you're asking people to do, I think will result in greater understanding and fewer papers. Yeah, so uh, let's see how I attract my students, right? So that, that's probably more uh, practical. So I think there are a lot of people who really driven by curiosity, still there's such people. And so this is definitely, you can a lot of puzzles, it's like a detective mysteries you want to solve. And also just in terms of whether a citizen responsibility that we, we, we all gonna be treated by some AI algorithms. Don't you freak out that this algorithm is so now vetted and it's hidden in your clean decisions. And for that, I think there's a personal reason we should all pay attention in digital health. That's clinical trial observation studies that this clinical aid are coming and it's professional responsibility. So it's like a duty call. And the, the upside for if you get engaged in understanding research when you're young, I think with a very, very high probability, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years down the road, you become the best researcher you could become. You won't see it next year. If you keep writing a lot of small papers and fast papers, I think you're really not giving yourself the chance to become the best researcher you can be because your mind is not working the right way. I know you need to have patience to, to, to trust me, but I think there are a lot of you can look at uh, psychological studies to show that the short-term memories, the short-term things don't stay and you don't actually become smarter uh, as the best you can be. So this is probably a long-term thinking. If you're really ambitious, I call upon you to take the understanding approach because you can actually achieve, if you want to, your ambition to be a top scientist. I think many, I hope all of us want to be, and this is the way to go. Uh, you might be very famous taking the fast approach, but the inner circle really know how good you are. So you cannot really get away with uh, sloppy work, if you ask me. People know, there are good people who know if you're doing sloppy work. You can get all the awards and this and that, but your friends know. And I think that's hopefully matter to you because eventually we have social animals, how people think of you. You don't want to go to a conference feeling like, gosh, everybody thinks that my work actually not good, but I'm getting this big award. That's not a good feeling. And people talk. So um, that's one thing don't ignore that not everybody's blind to think that you have this top number of papers, therefore you're such a top scientist. That's the illusion. And top scientists actually don't believe that. 
So you can make the average people believe by how impressive you look like. But if you're really smart, actually, you know it yourself too. So for me, it's like you can sleep at night. It's very important for me and understanding. So I don't know if that explains my uh, thinking. Uh, I think Jess have heard many times. He's just getting me to talk about it again. <laughs> yeah. I think it's important to make these things common knowledge. Like we don't discuss these meta levels of research enough. And I think that's part of the underlying issues that we're confronting. Let me ask a, a, another question. It's sort of like, you know, sort of like, you know, statistics writ large, we've been doing this for a little more than a hundred years. So we've come to agreement that when I do some study and I want to report something, I report two numbers. The first, my estimate. And the second is, well, it's either a p-value or a variance or a standard error, but that's kind of like the second number. There's two numbers, right? And then should there be a third number? Like, why isn't there a third number, right? You would think the third number should be something about stability, robustness, or something, but, you know, we're at two numbers and we've been stuck there for a long time. Should there be a third number, a third metric? I think so. Also the contact, that's documentation. I think we really need to enlarge our reporting kind of format. For me, actually, I like to see, you know, like this perturbation intervals. I want to see, you give me a different, you give me two, two numbers, right? Two pairs of numbers I want to see. At least if you want to really do the small next steps, you should have a different two clean sets of data. Each you give me two numbers. I want to see the two other numbers from the other clean, right? Four numbers. That's hopefully a minimum. Just another clean version data, right? Let's do the work, do another clean version. So each data that give you two numbers and give me two other number from the other clean data. That's a minimum that I think we can move there. Not too hard. And then I like to see actually more than that. Right? I like to see, uh, give me a little distribution. If you want to do the quick stability analysis, give me not just variance. Actually, I want to see a small distribution, a plot or something. That's what I like to see. So one number and a little plot. And then you have two clean data, one number, two sets of such. I don't think it's very excessive. And then I think that's already to show you what's going on. If they're very different, I think it's, we should show the patients maybe even that. And then the patient will get us to say that, hey, why they're so different. This is that my blood pressure will go down this much. The other one says it go down much less. What's going on? And you have to explain. So this is really about explainability. I think a lot of laws are coming in Europe and we have to heed that too pretty soon. I think the pressure will be on when Europe goes there, the regulations. But I think the community should not be so passive. We should be proactive, try to change how we do things. That's, you know, PCS is our attempt to do that. And come in, join us and do better. I hope this is never, definitely not definitive answer. It's attempt. And I hope we all agree principle stability. Do your own version and think about these issues and do better for young people. I think you can. And statistics, the fate of Usefulness of statistics in your hands. And if you don't do it, I don't think statistics as a field will be very prosperous or causal inference will be very prosperous. It's, it's not an investment. I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I actually think that this is a perfect spot to end with this big statement and I, on the importance of statistics and causal inference moving forward. So thank you for finishing up the talk in this uh, excellent way. And thank you also, Josh, for making this discussion. Um, let's wrap up the seminar here since we're a little bit behind and then you can stay around and chat if you want to chat. Thank you. More. Um, all right. Okay, so next week we'll have Mona Azatkia from ETH Zurich. Um, Mona will be presenting a fast non-parametric approach for causal structured learning in holly trees. Hope to see you then.